Hi, Captain Steve for Boat Test Reports. Thanks for being with us today. This week's episode is sponsored by Boston Whaler, the first brand on the water that was unsinkable. Last week was earnings season on the stock market and Garmin, which is best known for its marine electronics like chart plotters, announced that its total revenue in the second quarter of 2020 was $870 million, a 9% year-over-year increase. The company reported strong sales in fitness and marine especially. Revenue from the marine segment grew 4% in the second quarter, led by chart plotters and panoptic sonar technology. Additionally, Garmin has expanded its exclusive relationship with Regulator Marine, which announced that it will feature Fusion Apollo Series stereos on its standard equipment list. Garmin also launched Quantix Solar, its first smartwatch for marine use that features solar charging technology. Cox Powertrain's first production CXO300 diesel outboards for the North American market are headed to its Florida-based distributor, Ring Power. Cox says that the majority of its customers are in North America and Rick Chapman, the Cox business manager at Ring Power, said many customers have shown interest in the diesel burning 300 horsepower outboard. The company is going to repower its Intrepid Nomad 345 demonstration boat from pre-production CXO 300s to production units. Then Ring Power will take the boat on the road to show off the motors to prospective customers. As a friendly reminder to all who trailer their boats, strap them down before going down the road. Last week in Pennsylvania, for one of a strap down, a boat stopped traffic, the owner was embarrassed, the boat was scratched up, and roads were closed for about an hour. A little further north in upstate New York, two boats were damaged when a car flew off the docks at the LaSalle Yacht Club and landed on them. It happened around 6.30 a.m. on July 28th, and the driver said she was spooked by a spider and lost control of the vehicle. She and a passenger crawled out of the car and onto the dock uninjured. There's no word about the condition of the spider. UK boat builder Princess Yachts recently introduced its first X95 yacht, Superfly. Princess moved the helm off the main deck and created a sky lounge with the helm. Princess said this resulted in a 30% more interior volume increase and a wide open, less formal main deck with a casual but accessible galley and dining area. Up on top, the Sky Lounge features an outdoor aft section, while indoors, there are protected lounges with the helm station forward. Below decks, she has four cabins with en suites, including a full beam master. There are also captains and crew quarters. On the water, the X95 hits a top speed of 23 knots with 3,800 combined horsepower, according to the builder, and she has a range of 2,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Last week, Regal launched its new 36 Grand Coupe and new 36XO on July 28th. The 36XO has a swim platform that wraps around the available twin 350 horsepower or 425 horsepower Yamaha outboards. The 36 Grand Coupe is a twin Volvo Penta dual prop boat that can have up to 800 combined horsepower in gas or diesel. She has a full beam swim platform. Both models have Regal's adjustable ultra lounge that can slide to open up space on the swim platform or in the cockpit. On both boats, the galley has an electric stove, a refrigerator, and sink, plus a fold-away TV. Moving indoors, to starboard, the helm comes with a standard 22-inch Garmin multifunction display or optional dual 16-inch models. A joystick, bow thruster, and autopilot are available. On each model, slide open the windshield to head to the bow where there is adjustable seating. Heading below decks, there's a forward stateroom with a queen berth and the aft cabin has face-to-face -face seating that transforms to a second queen berth. Watch for test and features video on the Regal 36 Grand Coupe and Regal 36 XO in the future at BoatTest.com. Quench C, a handheld desalinator, will go into full production and be available in February of 2021 for as little as $60 thanks to a successful crowdfunding campaign. It could be useful for owners of small power boats or sailors who like to head offshore, and it should certainly be part of any life raft ditch bag. The handheld device instantly turns seawater into fresh water using manual power and can reportedly make up to three liters of drinkable water per hour. Each unit comes with an extra filter. For more information about this, please go to Boatest.com. Boatest is here to inform consumers about the important features of boats. One of the most popular sizes for center consoles is in the 22 to 24 foot range, so let's take a look at one of the most popular boats in that size range, the Rabalo R230. Taking a look at some of the important features, the aft casting platform is finished in non-skid for sure-footed angling. 
When seating is needed, release the bungees and the backrest lift up easily. At the dash, the R230 has plenty of real estate for electronics, like the 9-inch Simrad screen on our test boat. The stainless wheel is on a tilt base and the controls are in reach to starboard. The helm seat was at an ergonomic distance from the console. In the bow, we see the R230's dual personality with removable backrests for family-friendly lounges and a table that converts to a sun pad or casting platform. To get more details, check out our full features inspection and performance video on BoatTest.com. Last week in our seamanship series, we started looking at knots and most importantly, the bowline. This week, we're gonna look at another important knot, the clove hitch. This is a clove hitch. Now this is used for securing a line to a piling. So we'll assume that the boat is behind me. Here's the piling I'm gonna to secure to. I go around under the first part of the line. And notice here, this is where we create the lock. Come around again, and then just tuck it into this part by going down. I've got a line that's nice and secure. That'll hold the boat all day long. It's also easy to tie this by making two underhand loops. Underhand loop, underhand loop, and there's our clove hitch. Now let's take a commercial break for this week's sponsor, Boston Whaler, which is celebrating its 62nd year in business this summer. Boston Whaler was originated by Dick Fisher sometime in the early 50s. He was reading a magazine, a uh, popular mechanics magazine, about a couple of new components. One was called fiberglass and the other one was called styrofoam. Fisher did some engineering with it and created what we now have as our Unibond construction, which is a full bottom or hull. And what makes Whaler unique is the inner liner. He marries those two pieces with a special process weld and then completely fills the core with the polyurethane foam, making it unsinkable. You could cut that boat into a hundred pieces and every single one of those would float. He wasn't trying to start a boat company to go sell a bunch of boats. He was building something for himself and he was doing it with cutting edge materials and new thoughts and new innovation, uh, trying some things that nobody had ever tried. And we do that today. The brand moved from Rockland, Mass. on around 1987, uh, moving to Florida. Since that time, this entire campus has evolved into one of the premier boat building facilities in the world. We're taking a refined design concept and all the ideas from our industrial design team and we're bringing it to life. Last year, Mercury Racing introduced the 450 horsepower, 4.6 liter V8 turbocharged 450R outboard engine on the same block as the Mercury 300 horsepower engine. So the question begs, how can it hang together with 50% more horsepower, much greater component stress, and higher temperatures? And with a new 4.6 liter block, why is Mercury still building the 2.6 liter supercharged 340 and 400 horsepower engines? To answer those questions, we're joined today by Stuart Halley, the general manager of Mercury Racing. So Stuart, why did you develop this engine? Well, this engine, I think uh, you have to kind of step back and look at its predecessor. When the 400R was released in 2015, that really kind of opened up a market that really wasn't there. I think people identified with the racing brand and it really aligned very well with uh, performance luxury boats, which were on the, on the rise being developed. So we saw an opportunity. If you look at the VA platform, when that was originally designed, there were versions for the consumer, for commercial fishermen, for pro fishermen, and then also the performance version, which is our R series. When that engine was developed, we have a 10 year product plan and we looked and, and basically protected that V8 platform for a supercharged version, which was released just over a year ago. You know, it's kind of an evolution of uh, 
what the 400R did for that space, but it's, uh, you know, it's a very unique engine and much more performance uh, than the 400R. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, previously the highest horsepower for this block was 300, is that correct? Absolutely, so 300, and then we were able to, uh, again, with a supercharger that we designed with IHI Turbo, that uh, that supercharger enables us to get to 450 horsepower with uh, the 450R. We actually found two things. It was one main thing that opened up two improvements, and it was really around the airflow coming in the top of the supercharger. It really cleaned up the airflow into the engine, but also enabled us to do improved lubrication of the gear sets. How do you cool the supercharger? It's water cooled. That casting is integral with the uh, crankcase cover on the engine, and then we can route water through that to cool the supercharger and also cool the oil in the crankcase. Why didn't you use the 4.6 liter block to make the 350 and 400 horsepower upwards? It's been around for a few years. You know, we updated in 2015, and we feel that is still the best 350, 400 out there. It's a, it's a great engine. One of the things that you do when you are trying to develop a new platform, you look at really what are the critical horsepower nodes that you're trying to design a platform for. Now, ideally, an engineer will want to design a point design at every key horsepower because then he gets the optimum design. Because when you start to stretch those horsepower nodes down lower, the lower horsepower engines may not be as, you know, as, as higher performance as they can be. And if you stretch too far up, from where you originally designed the platform, then your torque quality may suffer. Since you're increasing horsepower by 50% and there's a lot more stress on the block and all of its parts, what have you done to make sure that they can take the increased pressures and temperatures? You know, one of the key things was trying to make sure the engine had a lot of versatility. We designed this uh, engine originally for the supercharger, and then we were able to add some unique parts to the what was started as a 300R and then make the 450. You know, it's got unique crankcase cover, and some things like that. It's really something that we, we, pre we protected the engine up front so that we could do this down the road. These engines mount on 26 inch centers. What advantage does that give you over your 425 horsepower competitor? The 26 inch centers is something that Mercury's been very focused on for a long time. And what it enables us to do, especially for the racing consumer, is the fact that you can get more engines on the back. Your website says that the 450R has 40% more torque than the supercharged 2.6 liter 400 Verado. Why would anyone buy that engine when it has so much less torque? Well, I think uh, it comes down to the consumer and what they're looking for. It really depends on what boat application. Sometimes a 450 is a bit too much power for some. It depends on how fast they're trying to go and ultimately it decides on how much they, they want to spend on the product. So we still feel there's a good market for the 400R. We're selling those engines still well, and uh, it, it is a great engine. And what's the warranty? Warranty is uh, three years on our R-Series engines, and then we also have available our Mercury uh, protection plan that another five years additional warranty can be purchased. Thanks so much for being with us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, Captain Steve, I appreciate you reaching out and inviting uh, myself onto the program. Now let's take a look at some questions from the captain's exam. First question, you're standing the wheel watch on entering a port and the master gives you a rudder command that conflicts with the rudder command from the pilot. What should you do? A, ask the pilot if he relinquishes control. B, obey the pilot. C, obey the master. Or D, bring the rudder to a position midway between the two conflicting positions. And the answer is C, obey the master. Most of us have seen a pilot boat heading out with the pilot on board, going to meet a ship to help guide it in. The job of the pilot is to use his extensive local knowledge to provide navigational assistance. The master either repeats that advice to the wheel watch or rejects it. In either case, the buck stops with the master. He never relinquishes command. Next, what is the length of a nautical mile? A, 6,076 feet, B, 6,080 feet, C, 2,000 yards, or D, 1,850 meters. And the answer is A, 6,076 feet. So where did that come from? Well, it's the distance of one minute of latitude. 60 minutes to a degree, so each degree of latitude is 60 nautical miles. That makes for much more precise navigation than the statute mile, which is based on a Roman furlong and has nothing to do with the actual dimensions of the Earth. 
So that's our show for this week. Thanks so much for watching. If there's anything you'd like to see on Boat Test Reports, let us know by sending an email to editor at boattest.com. I'm Captain Steve, and as always, I'll see you on the water.